For better or worse, much of the design culture we've inherited in the United States is from the home of the English language, what we now call the United Kingdom. The UK includes Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales, and Britain, while the Republic of Ireland, the southern half of the island of Ireland, is a separate nation. With a strategic location not far from the coasts of Spain, France, Belgium, Holland, Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, the islands have withstood waves of invasion since the first humans migrated there, probably across a land bridge. Recent evidence has found that the islands were once connected by a landmass that's been named Dogger Land, now sunken beneath the ocean. When the Stone Age people arrived, they shared the land with woolly mammoths. As evidenced by this amazing artifact now preserved in a museum in Ireland. Sometime after the Neolithic or New Stone Age, tribes of Europeans called Celts arrived by sea. These early settlers first lived in roundhouses like this reconstructed village built from local materials with a fireplace in the center. This dwelling style lasted from the Bronze Age through the Iron Age until Roman conquest. Precious Iron Age artifacts like this golden neck ring have been found buried in various hordes across the English islands. The familiar Celtic motifs of twisting and bending animal, plant, and human forms are common across all of Europe. This unusual horned Iron Age helmet was probably not intended for use in battle since it's so unmarked, but many other artifacts like swords, mesh armor, and battle shields establish the warrior culture of the Celtic tribes. This ornament made of bronze was used to decorate what's called the Battersea Shield, and it's ornamented with red glass and elaborate scrollwork. Because the Celts did not leave written records, the only description of Celtic Druids, which may have been priests, leaders, or simply a description of a social class, are from the conquering Romans. This 17th century depiction of the Wicker Man illustrates a sacrificial practice alleged by Julius Caesar, where victims were stuffed into a wicker effigy of a man and set alight. Whoever they were, the wild-seeming natives definitely gave the Romans the creeps. Early Christians adapted and incorporated Druidic rituals, including the bonfires and costumes of Halloween, the mistletoe and bells of Christmas, the blood red of Valentine's Day, and the rabbits and eggs of Easter. Today, practicing Druids still welcome the summer solstice each year at Stonehenge. Into this land of Druids and Celts marched the Roman legions in 43 CE. They named the island Britannia. A Celtic warrior queen named Boudica led the Iceni clan in a war of resistance against the Romans, and though she lost, her heroism has echoed down through the ages. A Roman soldier described her. In stature, she was very tall, in appearance terrifying, in the glance of her eye most fierce, and her voice harsh. A great mass of the tawniest hair fell to her hips. Around her neck was a large golden necklace, and she wore a tunic of colors over which a thick mantle was fastened with a brooch. On the other hand, if she was like a meek little thing, it would have been really embarrassing to describe her that way. So, the Roman Emperor Hadrian ordered construction of a wall across the entire island from east to west, separating what is now England from Scotland to keep out the dangerous Picts. Portions of Hadrian's walls still remain, along with many other Roman ruins in Britain. These Roman inscriptions are from the very eastern end of Hadrian's Wall and are some of the earliest written words left on the British Isles. The Staffordshire pan, a copper alloy cooking pan with enameled decoration, is shown in this image. The Roman inscription around the rim names the forts that guarded Hadrian's Wall. These wooden writing tablets with writing in ink are from Vindolanda, a fort near the Hadrian's Wall. They read, in part, My fellow soldiers have no beer. Please order some to be sent. Wherever the Romans settled, they left behind imposing architecture and technological marvels such as plumbing and paved roads. At the Roman Baths in Bath, England, modern structures still rest on a Roman foundation. 
This carved gorgon head was found at the Roman baths that may have represented a pre-Roman water god. A number of these lead scrolls with Roman inscriptions have been found in the baths. They are called curse tablets and are dedicated to Roman gods. This one, called the Vilbia Curse, registers a complaint about someone stealing someone else's girlfriend. It reads, may he who carried off Vilbia from me become as liquid as the water. They were rolled up and thrown into the baths as an offering. As the empire collapsed, Romans retreated from Britannia just as they did from their other far-flung conquests throughout Europe. From about 476 CE, as the Roman legions retreated, governing structures collapsed and power was concentrated in the hands of feudal lords. The British islands were repeatedly assaulted by northern invaders, and at the same time, Christianity slowly caught on in various Anglo-Saxon kingdoms. This Anglo-Saxon world map contains the earliest known depiction of the British Isles. It was created around 1050, but is probably based on a Roman map. The shape of Scotland is very accurate, but the Cornish Peninsula is exaggerated, perhaps because of the importance of mines and minerals there. Probably begun at the command of King Alfred of Wessex, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle is the first history of England in the English language. Several versions survive, each maintained at a different monastery and de dealing with different reigns of English kings. For maximum entertainment based on the Chronicles, watch The Last Kingdom on Netflix. Lots of fighting and negotiating between Anglo-Saxon kingdoms and invaders from the north until Britain becomes unified as one kingdom. These items found in southwest Scotland were in what is called the Dumfries Hoard and include a silver engraved vessel and a gold hair ornament in the shape of a stork. They're believed to have been buried between the 9th and 10th century CE and include an early medieval cross and solid silver. Some of the items are believed to be Irish in origin, but the metal vessel is Carolingian from the Kingdom of the Franks, meaning Western Europe during the early Middle Ages. This is the oldest surviving English roll of arms. It contains 324 coats of arms and names of the Knights of Sussex, a quarter of the entire English baronage during the reign of King Edward I in about 1000 CE. This crazy looking book includes a history of England by the writer Matthew Paris, plus other material, including a diagram of winds, an itinerary of travel from London to the Holy Lands, including maps of each city, charts of the dates of Easter, and a calendar. Here are shown sections of the maps in colors and gold from the itinerary from London to the Holy Land, with fold out flaps that show additional comments. It dates from 1250. In the historical part of the book, images of heraldic shields mirror the illuminated capital letter A. Decorations in the margins are very doodle-like. Another pop culture reference, if you've seen Monty Python's Holy Grail, then you know all there is to know about the Middle Ages. In this period, the preservation of literacy and historical documents, including classical Greek and Roman texts, was almost entirely in the hands of the monks and nuns in cloisters and monasteries. Within the protected walls of these enclaves, there was genuine religious piety and also safety, education, and industry. Each one was a self-sufficient community that may have produced cloth, food, wine, crops, books, and medicines. Monks and nuns were generally from upper-class families. They entered for a few years or for a lifetime, sometimes to learn to read and write, or sometimes to shelter vulnerable young royals. As the general population was slow to give up the old pagan religions, monks were thought to have mystical powers. Some monk scribes were illiterate, even though they copied religious and classical texts in Latin. Walled monasteries sometimes prevented Viking-type looters from coming in, stealing all the gold and silver, and burning the manuscripts. Sometimes. Several important illuminated manuscripts were preserved in refuges on isolated Irish and Scottish islands, like this one. The Celtic knotwork designs inherited from European Celts, and perhaps before that from Arabic sources, developed new intricacy during this time and are associated now with this part of the world. 
From the masterpiece called The Book of Duro is this symbol of Matthew drawn in the year 680 CE. As flat as a cubist painting and constructed from simple geometric forms, this figure facing the opening of the Gospel of St. Matthew wears a checkered robe of red, yellow, and green squares and tile-like pattern textures. This is the opening page of the Gospel of St. Mark. Linked into a ligature, an I and an N become an aesthetic form of interlaced threads and coiling spiral motifs. Another masterpiece called the Lindisfarne Gospels was sheltered up in this castle on Lindisfarne Island. This is called the carpet page from the Lindisfarne Gospels, which faces the opening of the book of Matthew. Again, this was made in 698 CE. A mathematical grid buried underneath swirling lacertine birds and quadrupeds brings structure to the textured areas. A red contoured cross with white circular buttons brings a timeless stability to its churning energy. This book took six years to create. Both drawing and reading were seen as a means of meditation as the reader was drawn into the spirals and interlocking forms. Full of decorative detail and pattern, these books were valued for the hours they took to create as well as the gold and precious stones used to make the pigments. This picture shows a large chunk of lapis lazuli used to make a special blue that represented the Virgin Mary. Early Christianity was full of codes and symbols, in part because it began as a secret and non-sanctioned cult. This is the Cairo symbol, so-called because it's a monogram of the Greek letters Chi and Rho, X and P. They are the first two letters of the word Christos, Christ. The first mention of the name of Christ in the Bible appears in the book of Matthew, and that page is called the Cairo page. This is the Cairo page from the famous Book of Kells. You may have seen the animated movie. It was made around the year 800. Woven into the intricate spirals are drawn 13 human heads, two cats, two mice calmly watching two other mice tug at a wafer, and an otter holding a salmon. The fish depicted in the Book of Kells are more realistic in their portrayal than many of the fish in early Christian art, bearing some resemblance to the salmon perhaps because there's plenty of salmon in England. In another page of the book, we see a fish form the crossbar of an F. The animation was not in the original copy. This page from the Book of Kells shows the symbols for the authors of the four Gospels. Winged and stylized almost to abstraction, Matthew's man, Mark's lion, Luke's ox, and John's eagle float in four rectangles wrapped in a densely ornamented frame. The idea of a part human, part animal creature shows up in the earliest art from all over the world. The Book of Kells attracts over 500,000 visitors a year to Trinity College in Dublin. It's now bound in four volumes, rebound in 1953. The pages are all made of calfskin. Even during medieval times, it was not only religious manuscripts that were created and preserved. This page is from Beowulf, the oldest surviving English language story written in early Anglo-Saxon English about 1000 CE. Another ancient piece written in Anglo-Saxon English is Chaucer's Canterbury Tales. You probably read that also in some kind of English literature class. And eventually with growing literacy, wealth, and communication in all of Europe, printing comes to England too. The first English publisher was William Caxton. He was apprenticed in the textile trade and then trained as a woodcutter and printer in Belgium and moved to Cologne and then set up his own press in Bruges and finally came back to England. He published nearly 90 books. This page by William Caxton and Collard Mansion is from Jacobus de Casolis's The Game and Play of the Chess in 1476. The eccentric, jerky type used by Caxton ushered in the era of the typographic book into the British nation. At one point he quipped, My pen is worn, my eyes are dimmed from too much looking at white paper. William Caxton undertook to make printed copies of nearly all the works of English literature in existence. His work stabilized the English language and the shifting dialects therein. 
They were crude designs, but important to English culture. These pages are from his edition of the Canterbury Tales, printed in 1477. Fortunately, the beginning of printing in England coincided roughly with the age of Shakespeare. His first folio was published in 1623, seven years after his death. It's the first published editions of all of his plays. As in Europe, the spread of printing threatened the extinction of handwriting, which was offset by books by calligraphy masters like George Bickham. This is the title page for his famous book, The Universal Penman, in 1750. It was originally published in 52 sections with scripts from 25 different writing masters. This is an example of the typically English round hand style. I imagine this being the handwriting that Charles Dickens used in his day. The Age of Enlightenment was a philosophical movement which dominated European thinking during the 18th century. Enlightenment thinkers believed in individual liberty, religious tolerance, and scientific investigation. And yet, European power was used not to bring light to darkness, but to violently subjugate colonial people and extract natural resources to fuel industry and create wealth. William Blake was an English poet, painter, and printmaker who spoke to these Enlightenment ideals in an anachronistic, highly personal voice. Blake was influenced by the ideals and the ambitions of the French and American revolutions. As seen in these highly unusual page designs, his combination of combining poetry and prose with his own illustrations is sometimes called pre-romanticism, and one can see in it the seeds of Art Nouveau. This fragment of one of his relief-edged copper plates from America, A Prophecy, shows his original approach to book design. Although highly detailed and elaborate, each book is about the size of a postcard. Each page has a delicate, intricate engraving. The editions were printed in a single color, and then individually hand-painted afterwards with watercolor by Blake. The era of the reign of Queen Victoria of England is called the Age of Empire, or the Victorian Age. Queen Victoria was the only grandchild of King George. When her uncle William IV died, she became queen. She was only in her infancy, and it's almost impossible to conceive of the paranoia in court circles when she was young that she, and therefore the mon monarchy, might not survive. Her childhood was a nightmare. Her mother kept her under more or less constant supervision. Even at age 18, she was still not allowed to go up and down stairs without someone holding her hand, and all of her food was tasted for poison before she ate it. For a strong-minded girl and young woman, the constraints were all but intolerable. Victorian style was a movement in art and architecture during the Queen's reign, from 1837 to about 1901. It was an attempt to adapt earlier styles to industrial age needs. During this time, there were strong moral and religious beliefs and very strong adherence to proper social conventions. The overall design was very eclectic and featured sentimentality, nostalgia, and a lot of idealized beauty like puppies, flowers, and children. The Queen's husband, Prince Albert, took an active interest in the arts, science, trade, and industry. The Great Exhibition of 1851 celebrated the inventions and products of the vast British colonial empire. Six million visitors crowded into the building called the Crystal Palace, a high-tech landmark of steel and glass design that glowed with electric light at night. This was the era of the corset, the bustle, and the very big hat. Oddly enough, middle and upper class women found more freedom during this time, perhaps with Victoria as an inspiration. One element of Victorian society was the grand tour. Young English women would often study art, literature, history, and other subjects with tutors by touring the European continent, seeing historical sites, and learning French, German, and Italian. The Victorians believed that design, along with everything else, was a moral act. They believed that the character and integrity of a civilization was linked to its design. This is the interior of the House of Lords and the British Houses of Parliament, constructed in 1840. 
Its Gothic Revival interior evolved from ornamental details inspired by Gothic cathedrals. Again, pointing to a higher purpose for the design. The Victorian style was often overabundant in architecture that meant extra windows, cornices, cupolas, and decorative additions. The artist Owen Jones traveled to Spain and India sketching and studying Islamic design. He collected patterns from around the world to create a Bible for designers. This was a very Victorian idea to collect, catalog, and index everything, really harvesting cultures from British colonies with no thought of attributing the original creators. This plate shows patterns found in the arts and crafts of India as part of his book, The Grammar of Ornament. These books were extremely expensive when they were first produced, selling at over 50 pounds at the time, a huge amount in 19th century terms. They would be equivalent to a trend report today. In the preface to the Grammar of Ornament, Owen Jones included the following acknowledgement to the master craftsman. My special thanks are due to Mr. Bedford for the care and anxiety which he has evinced, quite regardless of all personal consideration, to render this book as perfect as the advanced state of chromolithography demanded, and I feel persuaded that his valuable services will be fully recognized by all in any way acquainted with the difficulties and uncertainties of this process. This book was made possible by color lithographic printing. This title page for the book by the photographer Henry Fox Talbot, called The Pencil of Nature in 1844, demonstrates the eclectic confusion of the Victorian aesthetic. Medieval letter forms, Baroque plant designs, and Celtic interlaces are combined into a dense symmetrical, symmetrical design. Note the sans serif font at the very bottom. And with momentum and machinery, we proceed to the age of industrial England. Why was England a leader in the Industrial Revolution? The combination of natural resources, including cheap labor, profits from war, and colonies abroad, and a new work ethic that promised a way out of grinding poverty and some upward mobility into a middle class, plus some well-timed inventiveness and an innovative banking system that provided credit for investment. Textile mills, metal foundries, and paper mills sprang up seemingly overnight, and the English countryside became ringed with factories around towns like London and Manchester. Of course, there was some resistance to the pollution, noise, and demeaning of the factories. Among them, a group of anti industry saboteurs and the Luddites. These engravings of Gustave Doré, a French engraver, in 1869 were an attempt to document the current conditions of London and to produce a comprehensive portrait of the city. The industrialization of design and printing was enabled by new technology, including color lithography. In 1803, the first machine for the manufacture of paper in a continuous roll was set up at Frogmore Mill. With steam, factories could now be located away from rivers. The revolutionary Fordrinier paper machine is still in working order at Frogmore Mill and produces paper today. Other printing technologies include the invention of carbon paper developed in 1810, composition ink rollers developed to replace ink balls, and the Columbian printing press shown here produced in 1813 where a lever replaced the simple screw mechanism of previous presses for lowering the platen. The Columbian press is distinguished by its bald eagle counterweight at the top. In 1821, the first commercial lithographic firm was established by William Armand Jennett Barnett and Isaac Doolittle in England. Now, I don't know if Isaac Doolittle is a child in this picture or just very, very wee. Along with this explosion in printing and communication came new industrial strength typography. English typographers stretched the limits of metal type, trying to make everything bigger, better, faster, and bolder. Letter press printers who worked with metal type faced increased competition from lithographers that could draw type for speed and variety. These display letters by Thomas Cotterell are 12 lines pica, or 
about two inches tall. This seemed gigantic to 18th century compositors who were used to setting handbills and broadsides using types that were barely even half this size. Like everything else Victorian, type designers wanted to add as many decorative details as they could. All of these variations of serif shapes were documented by type historian Rob Roy Kelly to illustrate how the square serif was manipulated to create all these ornamental variations. Printers and other self-promoters really pulled out all the stops to include every possible variety of type to shout at the passerby in busy English cities. Designer Robert Thorne came up with the first fat face types in 1821. Ellen Lupton, a contemporary designer, called this Bodoni on steroids. Vincent Figgins designed this two line pica typeface called Antique in 1815. The inspiration for this highly original design, first shown by Figgins, is not known. Whether Figgins, Thorne, or an anonymous sign painter first invented this style is one of the mysteries surrounding the sudden appearance of slab serif letter forms. Another Figgins font, this 16-line antique, represents a much larger and more refined version of the two-line pica antique on the previous slide. This take by Robert Thorne on an Egyptian or slab serif design was made in 1821. Comparison with Figgins' design reveals subtle differences. Thorne based his lowercase on the structure of modern style letters that radically modified the weight in the serifs. Not to be outdone, Henry Caslon innovated with the ionic type specimen from the mid-1840s. The bracketing refers to the curved transition from the main strokes of a letter form to its serif. Egyptian type replaced the bracket with an abrupt angle. This ionic type restored a slight curved bracket. This specimen of an early Clarendon typeface in 1845 is an adaption of Ionic that was even subtler than the developed from Egyptian. Clarendon styles were wildly popular after their introduction. When the three-year patent on Clarendon expired, other founders issued numerous imitations and piracies. The Stevenson Blake foundry produced a larger and more condensed version of Clarendon, shown here. The top two specimens are typical Tuscan styles with ornamental serifs. They demonstrate the diversity of expanded and condensed widths produced by 19th century designers. The bottom specimen is an antique Tuscan with curved and slightly pointed slab serifs. Note the care given to the design of negative shapes surrounding the letters. And this handsome face is also by Vincent Figgins, called In Shade in 1815. It was the first three-dimensional or perspective font, a fat face. Perhaps designers were seeking to compensate for the lightness of the thin strokes, which tended to reduce the legibility of the faces at a distance. This two-line pearl is an outline face. In outline and open fonts, a contour line of even weight encloses the alphabet shape, which usually had been black. Types that appeared white against a printed black background enjoyed a brief popularity during the middle decades of the 19th century and then went out of fa fashion. This design, six line reversed font by William Thorogood, is called reversed Egyptian italic. Wide, fat faced letter forms provided an extensive background for pictorial and decorative elements, like these letters by Woods and Sharwoods from 1838. This specimen quietly introduced sans serif type, which would become a major element in graphic design in the next century. This was by William Caslon Jr., a two line English Egyptian in 1816. Vincent Figgins designed this two-line great primer sans serif in 1832. An awkward black display font in his 1832 specimens of printing type launched both the name and the wide use of sans serif type. And what about the pictures in books? Let's look at a very British childhood that produced a very special artist. 
Beatrix Potter was an only child in a well-off British family. She tells of a lonely childhood where she was often left outdoors. She was a keen observer of nature and documented her backyard in beautiful personal drawings. As the famous creator of the character Peter Rabbit, we see her here with an actual pet rabbit and you can only wonder if his name was Peter. She created the character Peter in letters that she wrote to the children of her maid. Her sketches in these letters were transferred to books and then to many other products. She carefully saved documents and artifacts like this Peter Rabbit doll and licensing contract that reveal her shrewdness and careful attention to business details. She ultimately became one of the richest women in England, similar to J.K. Rowling today. During this era was the first time there was a conscious decision to design for children. These alphabet blocks were entertaining as well as educational. As the Industrial Revolution wore on, the quality of 19th century book design suffered. Books were cheaply produced and poorly designed. However, there were some exceptions. The Victorian book designer William Pickering was a prolific publisher of the 1840s. He worked well with printers and printed min miniature editions of classics in the model of the Aldine Press. Pickering's pages from a book called The Elements of Euclid in 1847 are quite astonishing. Although the ornate initial letters connected the book to the past, its revolutionary layout was far ahead of its time. On the title page shown here is the Pythagorean Theorem. Pickering had the brilliant idea to replace letters and numbers with colors to help people learn Euclidean geometry. This book was displayed at the Crystal Palace Exposition of 1851. The initial letters for this edition were designed and carved by Mary Byfield, who worked regularly at wood engraving for the Chiswick Press. Unfortunately, it's quite likely that the cost of publishing this book was a major cause of the firm's bankruptcy in 1853, with more than 75% of the stock still on hand. Mary Byfield went on to work with a designer named Charles Whittington for over 40 years and cut magnificent ornaments from other people's designs as well as creating many designs of her own. With her brother John, she cut fine woodblocks for Holbein's illustrations of the Old Testament and the Dance of Death printed by Pickering in 1830. This 57 cloth bound volume edition of British poets was again modeled after the Aldine Press's small pocket books. With industrialization, artists no longer created their own works by hand, rather they were mass produced. Logically, a group of artists began a movement in the opposite direction, the arts and crafts movement. The philosopher John Ruskin founded the British Arts and Crafts Movement. It began primarily as a search for authentic and meaningful styles for the 19th century in re reaction to the Victorian era's varied historical references. It was also a reaction to soulless machine-made production of the Industrial Revolution. Ruskin himself claimed to be a better philosopher than a painter. Arts and Crafts was a multimedia movement. It incorporated art, architecture, furniture, interior design, fabric design, wall coverings, rugs, ceramic stained glass, and graphic design. Music and drama played a significant part in the movement. This portrait is of Dante Gabriel Rossetti at 22 years of age. He was a member of a group who called themselves the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. Their intention was to reform English art with a return to the abundant detail, intense colors, and complex compositions of 14th century Italian and Flemish art. Rossetti recruited Jane Burton as a model, and she eventually ended up marrying William Morris. She, they remained lifelong friends of Rossetti's. He would have probably liked it to have been more. She consumed and obsessed him in paint, in poetry, and in life. She's described in writing of the time as the hauntingly beautiful Mrs. Morris. These portraits of her, again, are by Dante Rossetti.
William Morris, the most famous of the arts and crafts movement, was a wealthy, privileged son of a wine importer. He was widely read and planned to be a minister. On a European tour in his 1920s, he decided, let's be artists. He got married and decided to design and build his own house. These not very nice caricatures of Janie and William Morris are by William uh, by Dante Rossetti. He called them Jane and the Wombat. Hmm. The resulting house built by Morris was called the Red House. It was the beginning of the arts and crafts idea of total design. Morris and James Webb designed the entire house and everything in it. This early example of cabinetry was from 1861 with paintings by Ford Maddox Brown, Edward Byrne Jones, and Dante Gabriel Rossetti. However, William Morris's most lasting work may be his pattern and wallpaper designs. This example is called Artichoke Wallpaper, and it's from the Victoria and Albert Museum. This sketch is called Tulip and Willow, and you can see how Morris has planned out the intricate intermeshing of the tiles of the design. This rose fabric design from 1883 is still in use and in production. It's one of the most lasting of his patterns. Morris and company, his company, designed hundreds of patterns based on nature. You can see the influence of medieval works and even of Persian miniatures. This label is from a dress that I bought by William Morris in about 2015. You can see they're still using the same patterns. This chair is designed by another member of the arts and crafts movement, Arthur McMurdo. He was the founder of the Century Guild and an architect. This is his title page for a book called Wren's City Churches in 1883. And here's one of his wallpaper designs based on the peacock and a logo developed for the Century Guild. A flame, a flower, and the initials are all compressed and tapered into a Art Nouveau-ish form. I love this similarly interwoven little form, a decorative element from a magazine called The Hobby Horse. Another artist in the movement has the delightful name of Selwyn Image. That's his name. This is his title page for the same magazine, The Hobby Horse. This woodcut from The Hobby Horse was a memoriam for the illustrator engraver Arthur Burgess. We see a blackbird flying towards the sun over mournful downturned tulips. As the work of the arts and crafts movement spread, there was a renaissance in hand-printed books from a number of small private presses across England. The principal press was the Kelmscott by William Morris and his wife at the end of the Victorian age. You have to remember that these page designs were created as were the ones in the early renaissance by hand-setting metal type in an age where that was not the only option. Kelmscott was the name of his home, Kelmscott Manor. At Kelmscott Press, they designed the custom typeface Golden. This page is the work of William Morris as the designer and Walter Crane as the illustrator to spread for a book called The Story of the Glittering Plain, which was about knights in shining armor, a medieval story. Operating on his compulsion to ornament the entire space, Morris created a luminous range of contrasting values. Here's the title spread for The Story of the Glittering Plain, or The Land of the Living Men. Here you can see again the elaborate border decoration similar to that from the story of the glittering plain, but the overall page design is more structured in these collected poems of Percy Shelley. And another stunning title page spread from the works of Geoffrey Chaucer, one of Morris's more well-known editions. For this one Chaucer imprint, they developed a system of types, initials, borders, and illustrations that all combined to create a dazzling Kelmscott style. 
even on the more restrained pages, like these pages 18 and 19 from the Chaucer book, we see beautiful pages of texture and tone that contain an order and a clarity that make the author's words both legible and accessible. I had the pleasure of seeing one of these editions up close. It's housed at the uh, Rochester in, uh, Institute of Technology in their rare book collection called the Carey Collection, which is also the current home of the actual press used at the Kelmscott Press. And here's a photograph of old Professor Lemon pulling the devil's tail on the Kelmscott Press. Obviously, they're not making any more of these amazing hand-printed books, so the copies that remain are quite valuable. This was a few years ago. Uh, the Chaucer was sold for $102,000. Although he's sometimes overshadowed by William Morris, Walter Crane was an amazing artist in his own right. I love looking at these layout sketches from his book called The Basis of Design. You can see he does little thumbnails, just like we do, but his are quite a bit more ornamental, I would say. Um, he used these sketches to demonstrate the relationship of two pages that form a double page unit, and how the margins can be used as part of the decoration. Dove's Press was another small press started by T.J. Cobden Sanderson and his wife Annie. He was a bookbinder and an obsessive typographer who thought that William Morris's Kelmscott books were almost too centrally beautiful. He became partners with another uh, technical expert on printing and engraving named Emery Walker, and there was a big drama between the two of them. Walker set out to attack the problem of pure typography with the view that the whole duty of typography is to communicate to the imagination without loss by the way the thought or image intended to be conveyed by the author. In other words, the idea of the crystal goblet that just holds the words and the meaning of the author. He rejected all illustration and ornament, and they produced approximately 50 volumes of beautifully designed and printed books. One of their masterpieces and a very modern looking page designed with extreme simplicity and order is the book page one from the book of Genesis of the Dove's Press Bible in 1903. The book's purity of design and flawless perfection of craft have seldom been equaled. There are calligraphic headings in it by the designer Edward Johnson, who went on to become an important type designer in the modern era. Um, a remarkably pure, beautiful, purely typographic book. Like many of the other small presses, it was a family affair. T.J. Cobden Sanderson and his wife Annie worked together. And this is a photograph of Annie, who was also a suffragette. The dramatic story of the fight between Sanderson and Walker and the resulting dumping of the entire metal cast of Dove's type into the River Thames is documented uh, online. You can look it up. And recently, um, the pieces were fished out of the bottom of the river and measured and recast, restored as an updated digital facsimile of their uh, Dove's press type. On the left, you can see the original types when they were, as they were retrieved from the Thames, and on the right, a close-up scan of the original printing of one of the books, and those two things together were used by Robert Green to digitize the font. A rare female typographic hero from this era is Beatrice Ward. She was a type designer, type historian, writer, and an employee of the American Type Foundry who ended up living in England. She worked under the pseudonym Paul Bojan, whom she described as a man of long gray beard, four grandchildren, a great interest in antique furniture, and a rather vague address in Montparnasse. When the executives at the Lanston Monotype Corporation in London offered Paul Bujan the post of part-time editor by mail in 1927, they were much surprised when Beatrice Ward arrived in their offices to accept the position. She was promoted to publicity manager in 1929, which was virtually unheard of in publishing at the time, and held the post until she retired in 1960. This is her famous um, broadside, This is a Printing Office, which is still available to buy as a digital art print. 
In England, the Art Nouveau movement was primarily concerned with graphic design and illustration. It was a direct outgrowth of the arts and crafts movement, also influenced by Gothic art and Victorian painting, and the key figures in it were Aubrey Beardsley and Charles Ricketts. Aubrey Beardsley was a young illustrator unknown in 1892 and famous by 1898. He was said to be arrogantly aware of his own talent. He worked alone by candlelight, um, and his drawings first appeared in obscure publications, but then quickly became discovered. He, had, he drew erotic, humorous, and haunting drawings, and unfortunately died of tuberculosis at the young age of 26. This was his first commissioned work, a cover for the Studio Magazine in 1893. His career was launched when the editor Lewis Hine featured this work on the cover and reproduced 11 of his illustrations inside. This elegant binding design is much more representative of his mature style. It was done for a book called The Life of King Arthur, Mort to Arthur, in 1893. An interior spread from La Mort de Arthur with his beautiful black and white compositions. In his opening page for chapter one, you can see the Beardsley version on the left and the Morris version on the right. The Beardsley version is a little more tortured and more interesting. His, uh, the lyrical bouquets of the William Morris version were replaced by rollicking, rollicking mythological nymphs. His drawings were said to be fantastic in conception, but severe in execution. And you can see here the nimble use of, again, the positive and negative shapes of a dramatic black drapery draped over a wee tiny little face that's tucked into a bed. This drawing, again in black and white, uses extremely fine lines to suggest gray tones and intermediate tones, and is uh, typically overlaid with various mythological creatures. He had a bit of an artistic feud with Oscar Wilde, and uh, some have called his drawings unmistakably weird. He really defied convention. There was said to be jealousy between Wilde and Beardsley of whose work overshadowed whose. This is the illustration, an illustration for inside Oscar Wilde's book Sal Salome in 1894. Again, the dynamic interplay between positive and negative shapes had seldom been equaled. Here's a sketch for an unfinished binding of the Salome book. Beardsley's designs were used as inspiration for the costume design in a film version of Salome directed in 1923, both set design and costumes clearly based on his illustrations. Oscar Wilde thought that Beardsley's illustrations were too Japanese, who con he considered his play Byzantine or Greek. Um, he called Beardsley's drawings like the naughty scribbles a precocious boy makes on the margins of his copybooks. It was not Wilde, who, however, who asked Beardsley to revise four of the drawings, but the publisher of the play, who was offended by the grotesque nudity in them. In truth, Wilde was worried about the balance of the volume of whether Beardsley's illustrations would upstage his writing. Um, in realization, in retaliation, Beardsley filled illustrations with naughty pictures of Wilde. This drawing of the main character, Salome, in a black cape that was simply beautiful and quite irrelevant to the story. Meanwhile, in Scotland, the studio magazine and the work of Aubrey Beardsley and John Taroop influenced a group of young students at the Glasgow School of Art in the early 1890s. They inv innovated a geometric style that blended floral and curvilinear elements with strong rectilinear structure. Their symbolic Im imagery, stylized form, and bold, simple lines blended with flat areas of color to create a new style. Their influence on the European continent became an important transition to the aesthetic of Art Nouveau and into the 20th century.
This is Charles Runny McIntosh, a founding member of the Glasgow Four. He was an architect, a designer of objects, chairs, and interiors as total environments. His main design theme is rising vertical lines, often with subtle curves at the ends, tall and thin rectangular shapes, and the counterpoint of right angles against ovals, circles, and arcs characterize his work. He also used abstract interpretations of the human figure, such as in the Scottish Musical Review poster. And that these, yeah. He designed the cohesive interior for the Willow Tea Room, which was opened by a Mrs. Cranston. It was a new idea to have lunch and tea as an alternative to the pub, especially attractive for ladies. The space was beautiful with mirrors, silk walls, and silver chairs. Um, he designed everything, including the uniforms, the teaspoons, and the signage. And here's his interior space designed for a man's uh, retreat. Um, his style was very predictive of Art Deco, which came across later in his life. The four were two couples. Charles Rennie McIntosh mar married Frances McDonald whose sister was Margaret MacDonald, and Herbert McNair married Margaret. Here are the founding members of the four on a student holiday. The sisters held strong religious beliefs and embraced symbolist and mystical ideas. They worked in painting, graphics, metals, textiles, and interiors. This book plate design was by Margaret MacDonald. It was reproduced in Versacrum in 1901 as part of an article on the Glasgow Group by the Viennese Secessionists. This de design depicts wisdom protecting her children within the leaf-like shelter of her hair before a symbolic tree of knowledge whose linear structure is based on MacDonald's metalwork designs. And here's an example of said metalwork. Stunning. While Margaret was a metals designer, Francis was more of a painterly painter. This vision of Ophelia is by Francis. This poster is a collaboration between both sisters, Margaret and Francis, with J. Herbert McNair. It was a poster for the Glasgow Institute of Fine Arts. The symbolic figures have been assigned both religious and romantic interpretations. It's hard to realize that this poster is the one that was so shocking that it sent people over the edge. It was a poster for the Scottish Musical Review in 1896. The white ring and the birds around the figure create a strong focal point. Another poster for the same client, again with a shockingly new interpretation of abstracted human beings. Another artist from the Glasgow Circle was Jessie Marion King. Jessie Marion King illustrated more than a hundred books. She had a distinctive personal artistic style with medieval style fantasy illustrations accompanied by stylized lettering in a very light and airy line work style. Her grace, fluidity, and romantic overtones widely influenced fiction illustration throughout the 20th century. And she was famous for her wide-brimmed hats and men's cape. In this double-page spread for William Morris's The Defense of Guinevere from 1904, the vigorous energy and fragile delicacy combine in contradictory qualities to characterize her work. She often drew children, again with the same strong composition and delicate line work. You could see the influence, perhaps, of Beardsley, whose work she would have been aware of from the studio magazine. I'm sorry I'm going on about her, but I can't get over these just lace-like images. It's also nice to see her use of color in these four different prints for the firm Liberty of London. And the last of our arts and crafts book designers is Talwin Morris. He was an art director at Blackie's, another Glasgow publishing firm who embraced the ideas of the Glasgow Four and applied geometric spatial division and lyrical organic forms to mass communication. He developed a system of standard formats for publication series that could be modified slightly to create distinctions between the books. 
Here you can see the cover for a book called The Book of the Home. He applied his generic style to wildly different publications. Three different book covers in the Talwin Morris style. He created a special edition of Shakespeare called the Red Letter Shakespeare series in 1908. You can see here the subtle variation in the symbols on the front um, across a standardized format with subtle graphic lyricism that create um, economical commercial editions. And as we wind up the uh, 19th century in London, um, we welcome in the London Underground. The new electric railways of London were under the leadership of Frank Pick, and he was a genius in public relations and launched a successful poster campaign to encourage the use of public transportation. He selected all of the designers personally and provided them simply with a theme or a subject. In 1916, he commissioned the type designer Edward Johnston to design an exclusive patented typeface. The result was a sans serif with a consistent stroke weight whose proportions were based on classical Roman inscriptions. The identity project expanded to include signage, station architecture, product design, and the design of platforms, trains, and buses, and coach interiors. Through their commitment to design and their demonstration that design could make a positive contribution to the environment, the underground became an international model for corporate design responsibility.